always in this show, we discuss issues that affect Kenyans living away from home. Uh, and in the past uh, a few months, we've been talking about issues related to COVID-19 and the politics, uh, both uh, in America and in Kenya. Uh, this week, we were supposed to talk about uh, uh, domestic violence, uh, depression, and uh, an increase in suicides among Kenyans living away from home. Uh, but we've agreed that uh, 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 we can tackle that next week. So today, we are going to talk about something that really uh, any, anybody living away from home can relate to. And that is uh, why it's so hard to, uh, 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 to go back at home and settle back after living away from home for uh, five years. One of the reasons I've had a is that, uh, uh, you know, generally there's too much corruption in Kenya. The systems are not uh, good and all those things. Uh, so today uh, I have a panel of uh, uh, experts. Uh, uh, most of these guys are familiar with you. I have uh, uh, Professor David Monda uh, from New York. Uh, Monda is a teacher. Uh, he, he lectures at uh, City University in New York. I also have uh, uh, Washington Osiro, who is an author. Uh, he's based in, uh, in, in California. Uh, uh, also, once again, um, welcoming back Nathan, Dr. Nathan Wangusi, uh, who joins us from Orlando, Florida. And uh, of course, David Amakobe, uh, my neighbor in the state uh, of Delaware. Uh, Dr. Amakobe is a businessman. He is the CEO of uh, African Woods, but is also a social scientist. And for the first time, we are welcoming uh, uh, Ebo uh, Oriri. We call him Pastor. So he's going to be the pastor on this show. Uh, uh, Oriri is a, uh, a guidance counselor uh, who is, uh, uh, he was telling me a while back that you know, in the last, uh, since COVID-19, the cases of uh, uh, people seeking uh, guidance and counseling has increased. Uh, but we'll talk about that uh, next week. Uh, so uh, it's my pleasure to welcome Morili on this show. Uh, I thought away I'll go to uh, Washington to set the table for us. Washington, uh, we, uh, uh, many people, especially uh, 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 viewers from Kenya, want to know uh, why uh, people live their Kenyans live uh, their life, their relatives, their friends, and their neighbors uh, to relocate to start life in a new country. Uh, uh, for you, uh, before we talk about why it's so hard to, when you go back to settle back at home, what really uh, motivated you? Uh, what informed your relocating back to Kenya? And how was the journey? So, uh... Uh, Chris, thank you for uh, the opportunity and uh, my fellow panelists. Uh, nice to see you once again. So what informed my uh, lo uh, locating to the United States was primarily to go to college. So I went to uh, college in San Diego and uh, my uh, goal at the time was to come finish my degree in uh, political science, economics, go back home and join the foreign service because uh, uh, a relative was uh, the a relative minister for foreign affairs at the time, but obviously that did not pan out because that relative was uh, assassinated. Um, so I was faced with uh, deciding what, what to do, given the fact that uh, my primary focus was to get my education and go back. Uh, at the time, I was working in a, a restaurant, Jack in the Box, to be exact, and uh, one of my customers happened to be a CEO of a manufacturing company also in San Diego. And it's, we were both runners. So, so he gave me the opportunity to come and try out uh, his company. And that's, uh, that's how I got into, into the biotech field. So to answer a long story short is I came to the US to go to college. My plan was to go back home. Uh, the social political uh, situation back home kind of changed the calculus for me. I happened to meet somebody who was willing to give me an opportunity in his company. I joined his company and I've been in the biotech field since then. 
Awesome, awesome. Hey, 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 Pastor Oridi, hey, you are pastor of the Kenyan community uh, in, uh, in Ohio. And uh, beyond that, you, you know, I always say that, uh, say that pastors, our pastors here play very many roles. One, uh, apart from just being our spiritual counselors, they're also our, our, our ATMs. When everybody has a problem, they have to go uh, to our pastors. And like, you know, uh, American pastors who go to church for one hour and they're gone, you, on, you, you only see your pastor uh, during the, the service. You guys have to deal with so many social issues, uh, uh, some of which we are, we are going to be discussing uh, next week. Uh, but uh, 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 you've, you're raising a family, of course, here. Uh, why do you think uh, 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 many people, after spending some time here, or let's say away from home, find it so hard to go and settle back at home? Uh, thank you, Chris, and thank you, panelists. Um, again, my name is Abel O'Reary. I live in, here in Cleveland, Ohio, uh, from Homer Bay, Kenya. So um, all of us are from that part. Um, I, I'm a pastor of a small church. I've uh, been doing this work or this calling or fulfilling this call in my life for over 30 years now. I've been um, here in the United States that long. And, um, and so um, I've had quite a good feel of um, um, what some of the challenges our people go through when they come here and even when they go back to settle home. And so um, I think I can have a little say on, on that part. Um, I'm also, um, like my brother is a business person, I'm also running a, a small counseling agency here um, that provide mental health, family type of counseling, as well as uh, working with the United States uh, military, doing consulting work for them, mental health, as well as uh, I have some teachers there. I also have some supervision of some of my doctoral and master students that are also in, the, in this profession. So I've got a feel of um, what um, uh, our people may be going through both um, here and even when they go back home and they come back and we do talk about what you know the experiences really are. Um, so um, I don't know what to say, but I think we'll be discussing a little more about from my own experience, what I see, you know, some of the challenges that <clears throat> some of us do find, especially when we leave here and go back home. Um, one of those examples, I went back home and um, there are certain challenges find myself in the village um, most of my friends most of my age mates uh, are they're very very old and some of them are gone and uh, and so I think some of the certain challenges back home in the rural areas uh, that can create a certain um, feeling that uh, we expect you know something different when we go there you find yourself um, uh, walking through or getting into a new ball game altogether. In so fact, uh, in fact, Eber, we'll come back to that. Uh, uh, let me bring in uh, uh, somebody else who who has been who has gone back home and uh, uh, after living here for some time and uh, soon find himself back on the international trail. And that's uh, uh, Dr. Nathan Wangosi. Uh, 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 Nathan, you. Yes. You, uh, you lived here for some time. You, uh, you grew up most of the time here in, in America. But then uh, at some point you decided to go back home to be a part of the new Kenya sort of thing. Uh, what was yeah. your experience? So, so th thanks, uh, Chris, for having me on the show. Um, I, I think my, my story is uh, quite unique in that respect because um, I, I, uh, I lived and uh, I grew up in Kenya and left when I was uh, very similar to most of the panelists here after high school to come and um, seek for education. So a lot of people leave Kenya for either education or economic reasons. And there's not a single Kenyan who meets in the diaspora today who, who was brought up for, for, 
uh, was born and raised in Kenya who doesn't say they want to some, some at some point in their lives go back. For me, that time came a little earlier uh, um, because I was always focused on trying to figure out what opportunities I could, uh, I could um, um, uh, create for myself that would allow me to, to go back home. And initially, I was not really focused on, on Kenya per se, but I really wanted to work in, in the African so when I did my PhD work, my, my research work was actually based in South Africa and I spent some time also shuttling between South Africa and Kenya when I, when I finished my PhD work for about four years. Shortly after that, um, there was a, uh, uh, an opportunity to, to go and work for uh, uh, an American company, a multinational in Kenya, and I also worked with, uh, with other um, companies and, um, and doing consulting work. Um, the experience was positive, largely. You know, they, they, there's a lot of uh, um, very uh, difficult narrative, especially around um, that first culture shock, which is, you know, for example, for me, the, the first one of the first times I went back home after many years, um, someone solicited, a police officer solicited for me a bribe from me at the airport. So that was my my uh, my welcome back home. But but. Over time, I think there's a period of adjusting. I don't mind doing it. It's about three years, which was just about how long it took. Um, Re-establishing social ties, um, uh, setting up economic um, uh, uh, ties back home. So that that experience was good, but it's true that there's there's a lot of um, negatives. And for me, one of the things that we're very difficult to deal with, um, and I'm not shy away from it, is corruption. But, but I think they, they, there's like the understanding of how you know, this type of people from, from the diaspora, how they behave. Um, uh, but my experience was largely positive. Thanks, Nathan. Nathan. Uh, Professor, Professor Monda, you, you, just like everybody else, you also came here straight uh, from, uh, uh, you did, I think, some one or two years at home before you relocated here. As a young man, uh, of course, you come, up from, you come from a relatively uh, good family. The Monda family is not uh, it's not uh, Chora Chora family like the Omalwa family. So uh, you come here and then uh, so suddenly uh, 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 many years, over 20 years, you're still here. Uh, uh, one of the things that I've, I've heard uh, uh, people in your position complain about is that uh, 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 even the skills that you have when you go back home, it's not, you can't really... Uh, 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 the country doesn't uh, provide you with the equipment to be the best that you want to be in the field that you are. What has been your experience so far? Uh, so I think um, this is a very good point. Uh, Africa very generally, and Kenya in particular, has lost a lot of its uh, human capital. Um, in almost every university in this country, you'll always find a professor or a faculty member uh, mostly from Nigeria, Ghana, or Kenya. There's a lot of them. So in terms of my field, um, I think a lot of uh, faculty here, they, they, they don't mind relocate, they don't mind relo relocating back to Kenya. Um, you know, they, they could take a pay cut, but I think part of the other issue is the, the infrastructure, the research facilities, uh, and just the, the general way of of, uh, of how our, our public um, universities are run. Um, there's a series in the media recently about how many graduates we're producing. And because of corruption, um, it eats up about one third of um, the Kenya's budget, which is about $6 billion. Kenya is ranked number 137 out of 180 by Transparency International in terms of corruption. So when a lot of these resources are misused and misplaced, that really has a big ripple effect in a small economy like Kenya. It not only affects the universities, teaching opportunities for uh, those who are abroad to re-engage with, with Kenya, but I think it also mortgages and um, uh, destroys the futures of a lot of young people. We're graduating a lot of very smart young people with masters, PhDs, bachelor's degrees, and people can't get jobs. People can't uh, find opportunities. And this is a big, big issue. And lastly, Chris, uh, very recently here in Manhattan, we had the uh, conviction of uh, Ibrahim Akasha and the Akasha brothers right here in, uh, in, in Lower Manhattan. And they were engaged in multi-billion dollar um, drug trafficking from Kenya. And they tried to actually bribe some um, 
um, FBI officials, and they ended up getting locked up. But the core issue of what you spoke to is the corruption, because the Akasha brothers were able to uh, live in Kenya, con conduct their drug business very openly for many, many years. And it's interesting to wonder whether if the the FBI had not convicted these uh, these individuals, would they have been continuing with uh, with their illicit practices? So it's a very entrenched thing, not only at the elite level, but also with the Mwanainchi. Uh, Mwanainchi people feel that they can't continue with their lives unless it's a lot easier to just pay a bribe and forget about a poli police officer than have to deal with a court process and go to jail. So it's a, it's a multifaceted problem, Chris. And uh, I think it's something that's really destroying Kenya. One third of our economy, $6 billion. That's one SGR railway all the way from Mombasa to Nairobi lost every year just in corruption into people's pockets. Awesome, awesome. Thanks, thanks, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, 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 Dr. Amakobe, uh, when, uh, before we started the show, we were texting, and you had a very fresh uh, take on this, on, uh, on this issue, and that is that, uh, you know, uh, systems are systems. Can you elaborate on, uh, on that uh, when it comes to relocating back at home and corruption and the complaints from the diaspora? Thank you, Chris, and thank you very much, uh, uh, my other panelists. It's nice to, to, to see you again. I, I listen, I hear Dr. Mo, Professor Monda say there's a general view, a perspective that is a narrative that is put out there that um, Africa or Kenya is generally corrupt. Okay? And that narrative is perpetrated by people who don't seem to understand that countries are different. You cannot want to make a country in your own image. So the point is, when you leave Kenya and you come and live overseas, then you go back and you want Kenya to be the country you li you, 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 you lived in, that's not, that's, not, that's not fair. And then again, to say, like for the example of Dr. Munda said, that Akasha were arrested there for running drugs and they would have been running if the US are not on there. The drugs are run, drug cartels are run from a lot of from Colombia, from China, from everywhere. We go everywhere to arrest people. It's not specifically Kenya. What I would like to say is Kenya, and be unbeknown to all of us, is actually running. Today, people woke up, they went to work, and they went home and they are taking care of the family. So the point, what I'm trying to say that your inability to navigate a system does not mean that the system is inherently corrupt. Okay? The, the, the fact and culture is generally the general pro programming of the mind of the people who live in a specific country. So if you are not programmed like them and you continually point to them as being wrong because they are not like you, that's not, that's not fair. And this, I, that's, this narrative of the country being corrupt is the one that devalues the, the resources of the country. Like say, uh, Professor Monda just said, if, if, you, if he wants to go back to Kenya, he will need to take a pay cut. Why does a professor in New York have to be paid more than the professor in Nairobi who is teaching the same subject? Is that devaluation? Is that devaluation which is which start by branding the country as generally corrupt? And therefore, the people who are there are generally undervalued. And then the, the idea of nuisance corruption. I can agree with the nuisance corruption. The nuisance corruption is to me where police ask for the bribe on the road, where a, a teacher asks for a little more money to teach, is, is a failure of administration. It's not corruption per se. But when we are talking generally about corruption, who, are, who is talking? Because I, I, I grew up in Kenya, went to school, completed, worked there 20 years, and now I have lived in the United States 20 years. I have worked both in the, in the government in Kenya, in the public service in Kenya, and I have worked both in the private, service, in private sector in the US. I can tell you for sure there is no difference. 
thing. <laughs> yeah, Chris, 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 Chris but, but, I, but, but Chris, I think, I, think I, I, I also must point out, just because we identify corruption in Kenya doesn't mean we're saying Kenya is a bad country. We are simply appreciating a fact. There's corruption in the United States. Yeah. But how have we handled it in our system here, for instance, in our political system? We've opened up the system. We've said, if you want to donate money, we need you to lobby, right? You need to show us how you're, 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 you're providing for, for a political okay. candidate, right? And, okay. and then secondly, right from the very top, uh, uh, Chris, President Kenyatta is on record in April 2019 of saying there were certain untouchable corrupt officials even in the state house. So it's not coming from our mouth. It's right from the very head of state. They can't be touched. Also, another example would be someone like Felicia Kabuga, right? The genocidal uh, perpetrator from Rwanda. He was living in Kenya for many, many years. And before what he... Saying? What I'm saying, and, and, and part of the reason was because he was able to pay bribes. And lastly, I personally have experienced solicitation for bribes from police officers, from government officials. It's not something that's not there. It's a fact. It's a reality. I'm not saying, I'm not saying that. Let let me just, I'm not saying that. But on, 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 on nuisance, point, or on nuisance corruption is not there. I'm saying that that is not the general thing that the, the Kenyans are doing their lives for. It's inherently flawed. So I think what Mona is essentially saying is it's not that we don't have criminal enterprises, corruption, uh, money laundering in any other country in the world. What is what is unique about Kenya is the level of impunity. It's not even the corruption. That oh, there are certain people who are not only untouchable, but that um, even what we perceive as a war on corruption is really just a witch hunt being uh, perpetrated by political um, actors against each other. And then at the, at the, at the, at the citizen's level, or what you're calling uh, petty or nuisance corruption, um, you can get away. From, you can get away with it um, uh, by by paying right. Pastorini, did um, I come to? I, I think I, I come to Ozira. Um, Pastorini, go ahead. L l let me say something here. Um, I think the feeling of helplessness by our people, the point where they have uh, accepted, mm -hmm. is so easy when you go there to uh, just to keep the police. Uh, wherever it's, it's almost like it is something bribery is something that is within the cultures it's part of our system we don't want to think outside of it yeah. i think that's where the problem comes in but corruption is in every society um so there's none there's no pure or free but the kenyan one i think we take it to a different level so this is something that we have to tackle for us to be able to to to, to have a society that we envision you know that, that can be able to sustain us in the future. What because I'm saying, we need to define the problem first. If we just say top level, every time we are coming here and say top level, there's too much corruption, we'll never handle it. What no, I'm saying, no, no culturally... Nobody says the top level. I think it's all, all, all fears from down to there. In other words, the feeling of helplessness has gone down mm -hmm. to the grass point where they expect, in oh. fact, they don't expect anything, even a job. You know, I wonder how many of our people have jobs without bribing, you know, so if you ask that question. I so I think there's a problem. Let me, let me, let me, let me, let me say something. Let me say something. So one of the well, things that I do, one of the things that I do is uh, I work with uh, small startup companies to help them set up their quality systems. Uh, quality systems specific to ISO 9001, ISO mm -hmm. 13485, you know, just ISO, quality, uh, quality management systems. One of the modules in the quality management systems has to do with uh, purchasing. Now, when you're purchasing something, you get a, a you set up a contract, you set up a price, and uh, then uh, you get delivery of uh, whatever the item is, and uh, you verify that what you, the price you agreed upon is what was paid, and the items that you agreed upon was what was delivered. Now, within the, uh, the paperwork, or, or what are known as quality records, uh, there are going to be margin uh, uh, tolerances. So if you uh, have uh, a price point of $100, 
and the item comes back in at $95. You're within $5 of your target price. So you are, you know, plus or minus 5%. Uh, if you are uh, $10 plus or minus, your, you know, your tolerance is plus or minus 10%. Now, the problem with Kenya is when we have an item that is $100 being sold for $1,000, being sold for $500, that is the problem. Uh, and the fact that it is actually being done willingly and willfully and knowingly without any repercussions. That, therein lies the problem with Kenya, that the level of impunity is so systematized that you can, you can set up uh, an IT system to flag such discrepancies, but they are willfully overridden by uh, personnel who don't suffer any consequences. When you look at our political system and also um, the private sector and business leaders, those that come to the top are only the best at what we all do. So our elected officials, you know, if you look in the, U in the U.S., for example, um, uh, whether it's sports uh, personalities or, um, or business personalities, the people who are extolled in a society typically represent the best of who we think we are. So if you ask any young person today who their role model is in Nairobi, they'll say Sonko, a corrupt thief yep. <laughs> who has somehow made it to political office, right? But it's because they aspire to what they think is best about who we are. So there's a value problem there. So it doesn't matter what the system, our system of administration, it doesn't matter with all those things, how affluent or not affluent the country is. It's that Kenya has a fundamental ethical problem that needs to be, that needs to be dealt with. It's not just whether it's the right thing or wrong thing is beside the point. The issue is because it's not, even if you go into the village, that village guy, you pick him up and make him a DC. Will he do the right thing? If I take one million dollars now and pick a, an organization in Kisumu of a guy who has just retired, he's culturally, is he tuned? to do what he's expected to do, or does he want him to come to me? Because what I'm saying is, these people generally, are, this is their culture. And when we come from here with this culture, and then say, this is what we want you to be like, we can't fit there, that's why we come back. No, but David, David, but I, I think I think that, I, I, I don't think I would agree with that, because I, I think uh, you're labeling Kenyans as as corrupt and as a corrupt culture, no, I, I don't I'm I don't I don't necessarily agree because I feel that um, the bigger problem with Kenya is is not only the issue of corruption but a lot of the ambiguities of corruption. So, for example, uh, a lot of our politicians are uh, are known to be corrupt. We we know their political um, cycle, their political history. They've been involved in multi-level scams and theft of public resources. And maybe, Pastor, you can speak to this. And those, those very same politicians will go to church, and the pastors in those churches, the clergy, will accept money that they know has been stolen from the taxpayer. And they'll accept that, that money. Secondly, uh, another example would be family, right? If any of us are appointed as ambassador or uh, the head of a foreign state, mm -hmm. members of your own family will demand that you give jobs in that foreign state or in Kenya to your family. And they'll be very angry with you if you are chairman of a foreign state. And during your time there, you did not at least, you didn't bring a certain <laughs> from your village into that, into that organization so it, it's a very it's a, there's a lot of ambiguities there my my, my red flag is flashing it's been flashing for the last uh, 10 minutes but this is a very very interesting discussion and i'm, I'm very very conscious that, uh, that you can't uh, uh, talk about corruption in one show these are some of the things that we shall be returning to from time to time so uh, uh we want to end it there, and I want to thank my panelists, uh, Washington Osiro, uh, Dr. Nathan uh, uh, Wangusi, uh, Professor Monda, uh, Dr. Amakobe, and for the very first time, we have a pastor on the show, Ebo O'Reilly. This has been the Diaspora Show. You can watch this show uh, live on uh, standard digital Facebook page. It, the show airs uh, live. Uh, it's uh, 
East African time at uh, 7.40, actually 7.45, uh, in the US on the East Coast, you can watch the show at uh, 12.45. I uh, want to thank my panelists once more for enriching the show with a very insightful uh, discussion and insights about some of these issues. Uh, thank you guys and uh, uh, see you again next week. Thank you guys. Thank you. Bye-bye.